both teams ready? Yes, we are ready, judges. Um, okay, so I am Michael Delgado, the first speaker for the affirmative. If um, the judges and our opponents are ready, I can get started with my first speech. I'll take that as a yes. Uh, so, um, little off title roadmap. We have three contentions here today. I'm going to name it really quickly housing affordability, racial segregation, and environmental sustainability. Uh, my seven minute time will begin. In three, two, one, go. Hello, judges. Hello, opponents. We'd like to thank you all for being here so we could have this debate. Uh, we affirm the resolution. The U.S. state government should implement a ban on single-family uh, zoning. Uh, we are um, So we're going to say that uh, any single parcel of land cannot be zoned exclusively for single-family units. This means that single-family units can be built on, an, uh, on a non-single-family zoned piece of land, but they cannot be zoned exclusively. We define single uh, single family zoning uh, um, as the idea that land is used exclusively for single family houses. Let's get right into our first contention here, judges, which is housing affordability and the status quo. We are in the middle of a housing crisis. Houses are really expensive, um, especially in areas like the uh, California Bay Area or in areas in Canada, even such as Toronto. Major metropolitan areas um, have house um, have units that are far too expensive, forcing people out. Um, and this uh, housing crisis is caused by one main driver. That is, we have a lot of people who want houses and not many houses to give them. Uh, sub uh, demand far exceeds the supply, driving prices up. And we can see that this uh, lack of supply is due to exclusionary single-family zoning. Single-family zoning is an exclusionary practice which, keeps, uh, which makes sure large swaths of land in the country are zoned exclusively for the purpose of building single-family houses. No other kind of uh, units can be built on that land. Single-family dwellings are 20% more expensive than multi-family dwellings on average. Judges, this is simple logic. Um, single-family houses can hold less people than multi-family units can. When you have more units on less land, you'll have a greater supply. If you have a greater supply, demand will be alleviated and uh, prices will go down solving the housing crisis. This is simple economics judges on supply and demand. So let's see if the plan passes. Some internal links here. The removal of single family zoning allows for the construction of more multifamily units, especially in areas where housing demand remains high. Um, we'll see more houses and units will, again, alleviate demand, um, create more supply to alleviate the high demand, which will lower uh, costs, solving the housing crisis. That's an important thing here, judges. The uh, affirmative solves the housing crisis by creating adequate supply. Let's move on to our second contention here, judges, which is racial segregation. And the status quo, we can see that single family zoning has been historically and continued to be used um, as a way of discriminating against people of color by driving up prices in certain areas to keep people out. We can see in areas like Boston with extensive um, and rigid single family zoning that uh, segregation is, uh, is some of the highest it is as it is in the country. While places like Houston, with very lax single-family zoning laws, experience high levels of diversity in their housing. Uh, we can see that uh, because people of color generally tend to be poor, that they cannot afford um, single-family houses as they tend to be more expensive. And again, because of this housing crisis, they cannot afford many houses in general as prices continue to soar up and up to unreasonable levels. Uh, we can see that... Um, the impacts of permitting multifamily housing is particularly strong. We can see that when uh, a single, uh, when multifamily housing is allowed, we can see up to a 5% jump in the amount of Black and Latino um, people in uh, these areas uh, compared to when they were zoned exclusively for single-family zoning. And over um, half the difference between levels of segregation between places like Boston and Houston was due to single-family zoning. So let's say the plan passes, that we um, abolish single-family zoning. This allows greater access to uh, land that has previously been unavailable um, to people of color and uh, poor uh, people on the poor end of the spectrum. And this will also allow for more integration, which is good for um, not only alleviate, uh, not only for uh, our culture, but also for alleviating the effects of racism with more integration, which is always a good thing. Uh, very quickly now on to our third contention, which is environmental sustainability. 
Judges, right now, single-family zoning has uh, caused the creation of vast suburbs of sprawling in, uh, sprawling roads with little public transport. Uh, multifamily zoning allows all this housing to be concentrated and allows people to be able to get around more easily um, via foot or bike or what have you, greener forms of technology. It also makes it a more economically smart de um, decision to invest in public transport in these areas if you have more people that will be benefiting um, in such a small area. Uh, for example, judges, if you live in the sprawling suburbs and you really want a Slurpee, you're going to have to drive all the way down to 7-Eleven to get it. This produces a lot of greenhouse gases. Um, but if you lived in a multifamily zoned area, you could be able to walk to a 7-Eleven because housing will be a lot more concentrated and um, uh, commercial businesses will be able to be closer to where people live. I um, also see that importantly, Heating and cooling is some um, is one of the most uh, greenhouse is one of the activities that releases the most greenhouse uh, gas per person, um, and that's uh, yes. I will take your POI. Pause my time. That's excellent. Uh, could you repeat the tagline for your third contention, please? I can. Uh, economic no, environmental and, uh, and sustainability. Environmental sustainability, not economic. Okay, uh, I will continue my time at five hundred. Um, uh, that heating and cooling uh, cause a lot of greenhouse gas emission and that multifamily units are much easier and more effectively heat and cooled. This means that the amount of greenhouse gas emitted from heating and cooling houses will go down because multifamily units are uh, scientifically more um, effectively heated and cooled. Um, so what are some impacts here? Um, that with multifamily zoning, we will be able to alleviate some of the impacts of climate change. Again, which is climate change is a major uh, force in our current world. And that by allowing the creation of multifamily zoning, we can reduce the amount of greenhouse gas um, emissions we see on a large scale, both, both through transportation and heating and cooling. It is the environmentally smart thing to do. So let me go over our case one more time, judges, that we not only um, alleviate the high demand in housing, um, making housing more affordable and accessible, ending the housing crisis. We also encourage racial integration and get rid of um, historic segregated and racist um, policies um, and allowing greater integration in housing. Not only that, we allow environmental sustainability by allowing us to transition to a more green way of living and forming our communities. For those reasons, we urge a strong vote for the affirmation. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just before beginning, judges and opponents, my name is Ayush Sharma. I'm the first speaker for the negation. For a brief off-time roadmap, I'm going to begin by just going over uh, the definitions of framework case level, and then I'm going to move on to our contentions and uh, conclude with the opponent's case. So if everybody is ready, then my time begins now. Good afternoon, or good evening, judges. My name is Ayush Sharma, and I strongly negate resolve. U.S. governments should implement a ban on single-family zoning. Our standard for today's round will be net benefits or utilitarianism, which can be defined as the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. So the voter issue, which is the most pertinent one, is the standard. To clarify, judge, just before we begin, so upzoning is like the opposite of single-family zoning, and downzoning down zoning would be um, synonymous with it. Those are two terms which we're going to be using throughout the round, so just keep in mind downzoning is um, single-family zoning, and then upzoning is the opposite. Um, just to clarify, single-family zoning is a type of legal cl classification that restricts the kind of residential housing that can be built on a property. Under restrictions, only single-family detached homes can be built, forbidding multifamily residential housing such as duplexes or condominiums, which we'll go into later. Contention one is the lack of information on ending downzoning. Eighty. So first, let's begin with some general consensus data, which we do have. 80% of the population prefer to live in a single-family home, and 7 in 10 Americans actually do. Allows This allows for a larger proportion of the U.S. citizens to buy buy and move into single detached family homes by keeping down zoning, which is, as I mentioned before, single family zoning. 46% of Americans prefer to live in the suburbs, which are degraded when there isn't single family zoning. But as cities from Sacramento to Berkeley move forward with plans to eliminate single family zoning, some op opponents question whether these desired housing options are actually affordable in the first place or if they'll even get built. And these answers aren't clear at all. 
only two cities, which are Minneapolis and Portland, Oregon, have eliminated single family zoning citywide. But even in these um, cities, there's not enough data on how they've fared. So we don't even know if it's worthwhile to go through with this ban. Housing experts say that it is way too early to draw big conclusions about whether allowing greater density in single family neighborhoods will boost supply, as the AF mentioned, and therefore affordability. And they know that there hasn't been a single study on citywide changes in these two cities of Minneapolis and Portland. So you can even disregard these two examples. So the point and the overarching crux of the argument is we don't have enough information to go through with a ban in the status quo. The widespread adoption of zoning codes in the United States uh, began in the early 20th century as cities began urbanizing rapidly, just for some context. So the zoning laws were created to prevent new uh, new nuance uh excuse me nuisances like factories from entering desirable neighborhoods so that's the whole reason why they have this in the first place our second contention is the cons of banning single family zoning number one is evasive affordability regarding the idea that upzoning increases supply and makes housing more affordable there is so much evidence that in fact it does the opposite in 2013 and 2015 there were plenty of experiments done by upzoning large sections of cities within the chicago metro uh, the chicago uh, area allowing for higher floor area ratios eliminating parking requirements and an increasing allowable housing density. In 2021, that upzoning of neighborhoods actually drove up housing costs and did not create affordable housing in the Chicago area. Keep in mind, judges, in case it's not clear by this point, upzoning is what the AF is going to be arguing for because it's the opposite in a world where we ban downzoning. Subpoint B, addressing the legal uh, the legacy of housing discrimination and racism. The truth is that redlining and racist codes, covenants, and restrictions cause discrimination in housing. They do not cause single-family zoning or neighborhoods. Blaming single-family zoning is like blaming the existence of high schools for students not getting the same quality of education. It's not really correlated. The problem is not, is not that we have high schools. It is the inequitable investment in education and attention to student needs. So what's the overarching thing here? It's that correlation does not equal causality. You can't just assume that um, the single family zoning is the sole proprietor of this housing discrimination, which is going on. Um, state and local uh, elected officials in California and across the United States seek to alter like single family zoning so that big developers can rush into these middle class environments where there's working class communities and people of color. And they're going to demolish their single family homes, which they have been working extremely hard for and exploit, um, replace them with pricey market rate uh, apartments, which are in the more trendy direction just because it's more convenient. So let's move on from there. The cities claim that building multifamily units in an affluent neighborhood will allow people from groups who previously could not live there to move in is unfounded and reminiscent of past race-based housing discrimination. Subpoint C is the environment. The general plan of 2040's housing element of SB 9 and 10 in California would eliminate yards and turn neighborhoods from green to gray. Vegetation helps reduce air pollution and heat as well as providing habitats for birds, insects, and animals. Um, and let's expand upon why this is relevant to us. The claim that eliminating single-family zoning will help preserve open space, eliminate greenhouse gases, and perpetuate a more clean environment is just a fantasy. Preserving open spaces requires mandates and not only that, but like land acquisition as well. So therefore, removing people's ability to live in urban single family neighborhoods just pushes them to the suburbs. And even then, SB9, the bill that I mentioned earlier, will not reduce the urban sprawl that is like gobbling up California's open space and agricultural lands. So citizens in these cities are will be questioning cities claims that upzoning will not have environmental impacts. Um, so for this reason, the environmental aspect of the debate also goes to the neg, and let's move on to the affirmatives case. So just to start, you can kind of take our standard and our uh, weighing mechanism as the overarching one here. I'm sure the AF has no objection to this as they don't list like a tangible one, but we can take their definition of what single family zoning was. That's fine with us. Move on to their first contention. So as you can see by hearing our speech, you know that everything we've said directly refutes it, but I'm just going to point it out. So the first thing was the status quo and the housing crisis in the metropolitan areas. Um, they uh, emphasize how it's an exclusionary process for ex uh, for exclusive uh, making of single family homes and they hold less people and how greater supply alleviates demand. So it's more beneficial to like vertically integrate. But you can cite what we said about the fishy idea of affordability. So regarding the idea that upzoning increases supply and makes housing more affordable. As we mentioned from the 2013 and 2015 studies, there is a number of uh, different pieces of evidence in Chicago, which was the area we cited, that show that these floor area ratios being higher does not help anything. And it does not increase allowable uh, um, affordability in this case. 
Uh, we showed how in 2021, the upzoning of neighborhoods, which happened after the banning of downzoning, was driving up house costs and did not create affordable housing. And therefore, you can't argue that downzoning will do the opposite. Um, for their second contention, they talked about racial segregation, um, and the primary key example of the study was in Boston. Um, you can cite our subpoint B and our contention too as well for this, which was about redlining and racist covenants and codes and the restrictions which are derived from this. So we talked about how it's literally it's clearly unfair to correlate this with single family zoning. They're not related. It's just a um as we mentioned earlier, like the uh, the um, not the illusion, but the analogy we gave was that blaming single family zoning is like blaming existence of high schools for students not getting the same quality of education. The problem is that correlation does not equal causality, and therefore it is an unbased assumption to assume that single family zoning is perpetuating cultures of racial segregation when it's clearly not from a logical standpoint. And if that's not enough for you judges, we also said that um, eliminating single family zoning by allowing up zoning to like even four to six units, for example, will entice developers to go into less affluent communities, buy up single family houses, convert to market rate apartments, which are trendy. And in that process hurt racial uh, diversity and therefore perpetuate segregation. Uh, there's third contention in my remaining time was about environmental sustainability. Um, you can cross apply sub point C of contention too, in case my time runs out, but that will cover everything for you. We go over greenhouse gases, we go over open spaces, down zoning, or excuse me, up zoning and banning uh, single family zoning is not enough to stop and uh, create a better environment because as we mentioned earlier, creating open space is the key for creating a better environment and they do not create open space in the AF world. So for all these reasons, I strongly urge it about for the negation. Thank you for listening. Okay, you said after the one and C you switch devices. So let me know when that's done. I'll start. Yeah, just wait because I think we are still waiting for the jet to rejoin. Okay, sounds good. Um, are we good to go, or do you need more time, Judge? Cool. Okay. Um, I'm Gabriel Stockwell. Um, I'm the second speaker for the affirmation, um, and I will be going over the neg case and then the aft case. Um, for those timing, my time starts now. Oops, I muted. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, so their first contention is about how you like upzoning is the uh, so they so on top of case. I think we agree on everything. Nothing more to do. Um, Okay, on their first contention about the lack of information ending down zoning, um, the first top thing to talk about is how, you know, 80% prefer and 7 out of 10 live there. Um, first of all, we're like not de we're not demolishing all single family zoning that's already built. So people who still want to live in single family houses can. Um, we're just saying, and even more can be built. So this, um, and already 70, as you said, like 7 out of 10, 75% um, of zoning is single family. So like this has little correlation um, like if we're building more, there's still plenty of houses for people who like really prefer single family zoning. And again, we'll go into the impacts of, um, up zoning. Okay. On the second, and then their first contention, the crux of that is like, we don't have information. Um, and so since we don't have information about ending down zoning, we shouldn't do it. If we don't have statistics that say that it works, we shouldn't do it. That that's, that's the crux of the argument, right? Um, so first thing is we use like clear logic, right? It's makes logical sense that like we know first off that the, the issue of the housing crisis is because we don't have enough supply for the demand and it's we know clearly um that like by increasing the supply the demand will go down the prices will go down the housing affordability will go up that's clear logic so just because we don't have enough information is not a clear reason why we shouldn't do it 
I want to make that clear. Secondly, like we can't know if it works until we do it. So the argument that we shouldn't do something because we don't have information that it works means we have to do the thing to know if it works. Like our side is using logic. They're simply saying we don't know, so we shouldn't do it. That doesn't make sense. Um, so again, this is, this is, if anything, this is just like, this is not against our case. This is just like, we shouldn't be so sure. Um, on the second, you just say that evidence says that it does the opposite. Um, I don't know any logic. There's no logic in here other than stating the evidence. And in this uh, parliamentary debate, you're not supposed to just state the evidence. You're supposed to use clear, logical, like you're supposed to use logic. You're not supposed to be like, well, this professor that I don't actually say says something, so it must be true. Boom, right? People have different opinions. Um, maybe it, it's, it's possible that your evidence is right, but we don't give really any logic for why it's right. There's no reason for us to understand where you're coming from. I can't move, move with this uh, argument other than just like giving you like a bunch of evidence saying the exact opposite. And in your contention, we don't know 100% that it will work other than logic, which is like really simple, really clear until we do it. So there's no way to connect with this argument unless you use clear logic. And you don't. You just state evidence. So I don't know what to say here, but the fact is that if we use clear logic and the fact that, you know, there are states which are, you know, moving towards this uh, way clearly shows that there is interest, that it makes sense. If there are states which have smart people there, a lot smarter than any of us, willing to make this move, then it's clear that it makes sense. Logically, it's clear that it makes sense. So just because you state like two or three statistics of the opposite, I, I you have to give logic and, you know, this the fact that... The, you know, the states are making this move clearly shows it's a good idea. Um, on discrimination, you say correlation doesn't mean causality. You say that the, that like redlining and things like that is what led to the segregation. And then the result of that redlining was single family zoning. And so it's not single family zoning that's at fault. It's the thing that came before. The issue is that Houston does not have strict zoning laws and it has way less discrimination. It is it made the, the the differences in discrimination made was more than half a percent because of single family zoning. So whether or not single family zoning is the reason for like the, the very, very beginning of the cause of discrimination, getting rid of it will solve. Right? If we get rid of something that is making just making discrimination, if we get rid of the world where you know more expensive houses are forcing people of color and, and people from poor backgrounds to not be able to move in these neighborhoods, simple logic makes sense, right? That's discrimination. People can't move into it. But by making it so everyone has access, that makes sense logically. Um, there's one argument about how, like, you know, in affluent, in affluent neighborhoods, um, it doesn't lead to poor, poor people moving in. It's just, like, more people who are affluent. Um, it's not, like, there's affluent, there's the middle class, and there's people who, like, there's, and there's people even below that. So um, there's no reason for us to believe why building in, you know, the urban sprawl, the vast majority of these areas won't solve. Maybe there's like a few places where the really, where the, where the uber rich live, and then it's not a good idea. Fine. But using clear logic, using the fact that like these states are doing this thing, looking at the Boston and Houston, the clear comparison between the most segregated and the least segregated, and how there's a clear differences of discrimination, like that makes sense. Logically, it makes sense statistically. Just because, you know, in the super, super, uber rich that it like just leads to more richer people living there doesn't mean you shouldn't vote for it. The fact is that um, middle class are able to go there. Um, on this argument about, you know, vegetation is good and how it's going to um, lead to an environmental issues, a majority of the green spaces in, um, in, in urban areas is grass. And grass is very bad for the environment. It needs lots of water. Um, and so the issue is that what you're talking about green spaces like maybe there's like a few parks which has a little bit of vegetation, but the vast majority of green spaces are grass and that's not good for the environment. If anything, that's net bad. Um, and so, and, and the fact that we're no longer increasing the urban sprawl means the areas, you know, that aren't already built on are still are going to be able to have, you know, these open areas. So um, that also there's no response to like the issues of like walking around, which I'll get into um, actually, I'll, I'll get around to the, um, the affirmation. So on the affirmation, you say it's like a fishy deal. There's a number of evidence that shows that multi doesn't help. Um, first off, that's conflictory because you're saying there's no evidence about the result. Um, but second of all, you know, there's no real logic about why. Um, and it is kind of like said briefly in like one instance, I'm like simple logic. We can't respond to this unless other than just 
stating other statistics. We're using logic, which is what parliamentary debate is about. You need to actually bring in the logic into the debate before we can actually communicate with each other. You need to understand your own argument to explain your own argument so that other people can understand your arguments, then we can then communicate and learn more. Um, okay, on the second argument about racial segregation, you just, again, go with, you know, uh, about how, like, redlining is the issue, it's not single family zoning. Look to what I already said. Look to Houston and Houston statistics. Look to the fact that the people who have less single family zoning, who are more, uh, uh, who aren't super strict, that is help. Okay. On the uh, last contention of environmental sustainability, um, you say cross supply. Again, look to the fact about uh, green spaces. That's mostly discussed. That isn't good for the environment. But there's no response to the issues of, um, you know, uh, of heating and how that is the most emissions per person of any form of uh, uh, of, um, uh, of emissions. And also the issues of, you know, uh, uh, of pollution from traffic and, and the ability for people to move around in a, in a more area is, is better for the environment. There's no response to this. So the fact is that not only are we helping the environment, not only are we leading to uh, turning this tide on the, the issue that leads to the most amount of emissions per person, we are also helping with pollution. We are also helping with the emissions from cars. And that is that is going to solve for health, that solves for lung cancer. All, if anything, um, that is probably the most important uh, uh, impact of the round. That's vote half. Thank you. Okay, um, just before I begin, uh, is everyone ready for the next speech? I'm gonna assume everyone's ready because, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, before I begin my speech, I'd like to provide a brief off-time roadmap. I will begin by going over the negation case first, actually. So I'm gonna start on the neg case and then I will go up to the affirmative case. And if there's time at the end, I will strengthen our own case some more. Okay, so my time begin, oh wait, sorry, one last thing I forgot to address. If you have, if you guys have any POIs, just shout them out because I won't be looking over here. I have my own um, document with all my evidence and stuff. So just shout it out if you have any POIs. Okay, so with that being said, my time begins now. Hello, Judge, my name is Gobin Malasani and I'm the second negation speaker for today's de debate resolved the United States state governments should implement a ban on single family zoning. So yeah, again, top of case, we don't really have any issues there. So I'm gonna move off over from that. Um, down to our first contention. Um, firstly, they claim that their main claim was that clear logic trumps statistics. And in reality, it doesn't. They keep making decisions um, regarding upzoning and downzoning, which have widespread implications on the lives of people. You can't just use logic to trump stats. And they claim that we don't have any logic when that is in fact false. We have clear studies which prove something. We have evidence as to why that might happen. And then we explain the impacts of those statistics. Just judge, imagine how much less efficient the world would be if you couldn't take statistics and understand what they did and understand the correlation between what was studied. You can't just research everything on your own again. Again, a professor researched this. It makes sense, which is why we brought it up. My opponents don't even have any statistics. They just solely went off of um, their logic. And again, they completely disregarded our points about Portland and Minneapolis, which we brought up, and they don't regard that there is no progress being shown from the existing examples of ending downzoning. And so again, all of those examples were completely disregarded and dropped by my opponent so they can flow through on your um, flow, judge. Next, uh, my opponent's other way to address this contention was that they aren't demolishing single family housing. So, okay, so if they make this claim, judge, first of all, it's a claim, but in the AF world, there's two things that can possibly happen with ending single family zoning. So, Firstly, there will be less single family zoning, which leads to less single family housing, which lead or meaning that there's a correlation between single family zoning and up zoning, which means that there's less single family housing or two single family zoning doesn't affect up zoning. So they have no access to any of their contentions, any of their impacts if they're arguing that single family zoning has no effect on up zoning. So judge, if you take their word for that, all of their contentions can be dropped. But if you want to 
I believe that it was a miscommunication on their hand and there is a correlation between single family zoning and upzoning, then you can take our arguments, which is that with less single family zoning, there's more upzoning. And so with more upzoning, all of our impacts flow through on the environment, on um, how the population would prefer to live in single family homes, et cetera. So now moving on to our second contention, which was on the cons of banning single family zoning. My opponents, again, they bring up their logic. I've already refuted this point. And, um, and then uh, again, they made broad irrelevant claims to make everyone think that we didn't use any logic, but they didn't address any of our sub points about housing affordability, not being as good as it seems because, and um, our responses to racism and the environmental problems. Additionally, they say that there's the green spaces in urban areas is because of grass and that grass is bad for the environment. Judge, there's no logic here. It's just a claim. A judge, I can clearly explain to you why grass is in fact good for the environment. One, grass can be used as protection from eutrophication, which is the runoff of fertilizers and such from, um, from these areas into nearby bodies of water, which demolishes the biodiversity in those areas. Two, grass is good for the environment because obviously it undergoes photosynthesis, takes in carbon dioxide, reduces the carbon output. Three, grass is good because um, it, it actually spreads this toxin in that area, which kills off all the weeds in the area, and which therefore allows for more biodiversity in cities. More biodiversity means a more fluid ecosystem. More fluid ecosystem means that um, there's more... EOI. Uh, go ahead. Um, would you say that the amount of, uh, how would you say that the benefits you just gave to grass, uh, do you think they outweigh with the amount of water that suburban grass usually takes up every year? Yes. I mean, yeah, it obviously outweighs the amount of water that suburban gas, grass takes in because again, the majority of this grass isn't maintained by anybody and grass can actually live on less water. And additionally, the water that you do use for grass, it's better to use it there than to completely waste it or spend it on less efficient um, plants, such as um, much larger trees, which don't take in as much, uh, as much carbon dioxide from the air as grass does. Grass is much more efficient at doing that. Um, and yeah, moving on, um, that's all their reputations against our case. So now I'll be moving over to their case. So in the first contention, they bring up the status quo and the housing crisis. And again, one thing that I would like to mention, the housing shortage problem is much deeper than just supply and demand, which my opponents try to simplify it to and uh, claim that that's the only logic necessary. Again, zoning is not gonna address the deep questions of ownership, control, resources, and intergenerational wealth. And all of these things are tied into the places that people live. And so, um, again, my opponents completely try to simplify the debate to their simple logic, when in fact they're missing the entire logic behind the housing crisis. They're missing that upzoning alone cannot solve these problems. And so none of those impacts that my opponents claimed can be taken in today's debate. Next, they bring up racial seg segregation, and we had our refutation about redlining and racist codes, which is the reason for this housing. But again, my opponents tried to just brush this off by saying that we need to use logic and we're only stating what is already stated. But again, this is um, just a way for them to ignore our refutation when in fact it does make clear sense. Again, it's just the fact that there is redlining and such which leads to this racial, racial segregation. It has nothing to do with the single family zoning. And so that contention that my opponents brought up can be completely disregarded. My opponents, for uh, their third contention, we refuted it by bringing up all our environmental impacts and they cross applied that grass isn't good for the environment. And they claimed that we didn't address any of their points about heating causing the most emission. And um, they claimed that we didn't address any of those points. But again, we address pollution and greenhouse gases. They're completely misconstruing our refutations. And additionally, I would like to pile on to those refutations. Um, in, the, in the United States, um, as we mentioned, 75% of land zoned for residential uses is zoned single family. And um, however, in New York City, that rate is only 15%. However, 
New York City emitted about 56.5 million tons of carbon dioxide and its equivalent in 2019, and it emits the third most carbon worldwide while only having 15% of the land zone for residential uses compared to the 75% average for U.S. cities. Meanwhile, San Jose, California is just under 6 million tons of carbon, while 94% of its land is zoned for single-family housing. And in fact, San Jose and New York City do not have large differences in the size of the cities themselves, so that cannot be a factor here. It's just solely the amount of um, single-family zoning uh, that affects the amount of carbon output. And so my opponents claim that cities with less single family zoning have lower carbon dioxide emissions is completely false with that statistic alone. And this is shown because as we explained, there is less greenery when there is um, less single or less single family zoning. So for all these reasons, I strongly urge about for the negation. Thank you. Okay, so before I begin, just a brief off-time roadmap once again, judges, in case uh, you're a reminder, my name is Ayush Sharma. I'm the first and now third speaker for the negation. The order is going to be NEG, where I'm going to make a couple of observations. I'm going to move on to um, uh, some more observations, and then voter issues, and then world-to-world -world analysis. So if everybody is ready, then my time begins now, so judges, just to begin with the assertion about the point of the red lining versus uh, the, uh, the racist output deriving from single family uh, zoning. So let's begin with what the op our opponents said to that. So the whole argument was based upon logic about how logic trumps everything that we are saying about how single family zoning is not derived uh, or does not perpetuate a racist culture. And in fact, it's because of redlining and historic covenants and practices of the such. So the, not only does the AF not respond to this claim, they actually misconstrue our point and say something which is completely different. They claim that we are saying, a, as the negation, that single family zoning creates, uh, excuse me, redlining creates single family zoning and redlining creates racism. And therefore we are trying to evade that by somehow like dipping out of the logic chain and um, just ignoring that single family zoning is a part of that link. But that's not at all what we're saying. What we are saying, if they need a reminder of what it is, is that um, the racist codes, covenants and restrictions that cause discrimination in housing are completely unrelated to family zoning and uh, and the, in neighborhoods. So when we say that co correlation does not equal causality, it's not that there is even a remote link there. The point is that there is not a link. There is no reasonable or feasible way to argue or assert that it is fair to say that the legacy of housing discrimination can be based upon the single thing called single family zoning, when in fact they are not at all related. To address another point that the affirmation makes, which we just want to completely disregard and show to you, show you as show you um, uh, what's what's going on with their uh, defense of rhetoric is the point about grass. So just keep in mind, they can't bring up any new points about the grass and uh, environmental sustainability and statistics about that. But so I'm just gonna be like rehashing what my partner said here. But the point is that we're talking about open spaces in the negation. There is nowhere we even once said that grass is like the ultimate, um, the thing that takes up the most space. So they, even if they bring that up and you want to buy that, my partner showed you that grass, it's worth it to keep it there because it's environmentally beneficial. And even if it's not, we nowhere in our case assert that grass has to fill every single open space or majority of open space. We're just saying that in the affirmation, they aren't creating any open space. And open space is how you create more homes and how you create vertical integration and how in, uh, for both sides of the case. If you want to create single family zoning, you need more open space. If you want to vertically integrate, um, open space certainly helps so you can create more units that can vertically, vertically integrate by like four or six units, as we gave in examples of before. So points like that that our opponents make regarding like redlining and grass are kind of just used to eat up time so that they can evade our true meaning behind our points and the true like warrants we have. Um, so yeah, that's like the two uh, sub, sub contentions as well as two responses to their uh, uh, second and third contentions. Now, once again, judges to affordability. Affordability goes um, it goes a majority untouched when it comes to our case. Um, really, they don't have anything to say about the general plan of 2040's housing element and SB 9 and 10 and what that does. Uh, they don't have anything to say uh, regarding the ideas of um, uh, the, uh, the lack of information on ending downzoning. 
it comes down to really one assessment, which is that logic versus stats. And that's completely false, judges. In the negation world, we have both logic and stats. And you need stats to be able to make reasonable decisions which affect many people's livelihoods. And just saying that pure logic trumps everything is not a feasible way and mean to achieve what they are trying to achieve in the affirmations world. They are trying to evade upzoning by saying that they aren't demolishing single family or that we aren't uh, demolishing single family housing. As a partner said, two things will happen. There'll be less single family zoning, which leads to upzoning, which leads to less single family housing or less single family zoning. It doesn't affect upzoning. So they have no access to any of their impacts. And finally, the voter issues. One is hypocrisy. They completely go back on a lot of things they say. Two is the misconcentration of evidence and refutations. Three is the weighing mechanism. Keep in, vi- keep in mind that it's utilitarianism and the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. And four is probability versus magnitude. To go back and touch upon logic versus stats, we win on logic and stats. Logic would propel magnitude. Stats would propel probability. We went on both. So for these reasons, I strongly urge about the negation. Thank you for listening. Okay, judges, I'm back. I'm Michael Delgado. Benicia, I'm going to be giving the last speech for the affirmative. Um, so going to try to make this an easy vote for you judges. That's my job. Uh, so for those counting, my five-minute time begins now. Judges, we win on all three points, we think, but most importantly, we are winning on our environmental sustainability point. I'll just quickly remind you of where we are in the debate and go through it, um, that in housing affordability, we've explained how we are in a housing crisis caused by a shortage of supply, that prices are high because demand um, because supply is low. Demand far exceeds supply. They cited a few examples of some studies in Chicago that said otherwise, judges. What we were concerned about was the lack of logical connection for us to work with between the statistics and um, their end point. Um, But, you know, we're moving past that. That's judges' discussion at that point. Uh, what we are saying, though, judges, is that by um, that because single-family zoning is exclusionary, because it means that vast, vast swaths of land are zoned exclusively for single-family zoning, it means that the amount of units that can be built in a certain amount of land is severely limited, and that by opening it up, that um, the market will take hold and demand and supply will rise to meet demand. That is simple. Um, economics judges that when the market is given the freedom to supply will meet demand we also talked about how in racial segregation and we pointed out how in boston um a city highly focused on um single family zoning we saw with some of the worst segregation in the country while well, in houston a lightly zoned uh, uh lightly zoned city we saw the least on um, the most amount of diversity um, out of any city in the country. We've also showed, we gave a specific example, judges, that by uh, getting rid of single family zoning, we can raise the amount of people of color in neighborhoods by up to 5%. This is because single family zoning was created as a specifically exclusion- exclusionary practices to keep um, prices high in certain areas to keep people of color out. By removing these barriers, we allow houses to become cheaper allowing greater integration and lowering segregation in these areas. And most importantly, judges, on our environmental sustainability point, we pointed out that single-family zoning is terrible for the environment. It creates a vast suburban sprawl um, that re- that is only navigable um, by car and where uh, public transport makes little economic sense to even consider. That by uh, zoning for multifamily zoning, we help uh, cause a vertical development. Uh, which makes public transport a more economically feasible option for cities to consider and also means that we will see far less emission from cars. Um, the uh, negation rebutted this by giving us by comparing um, the metropolis of New York City um, with San Jose um, in greenhouse gas emissions, which we don't see as a fair comparison. That, um, that logically speaking, if we have people living in closer quarters, they won't have to drive everywhere, judges. The suburban sprawl will go away. We will build vertically. And that because of this, we will lower emissions. This is very important, judges. Like my partner said, these high emissions have major health effects on people. These high emissions can cause lung cancer. They can cause asthma. These high emissions are a contributing factor to climate change, which is one of the paramount issues of our age. That by de- um, the, but that by getting rid of single-family zoning, we are allowing this vertical buildup and we are allowing 
um, our um, simple market economics to lead to a decrease in car use and a decrease of emissions. This means we have a healthier population and a climate that isn't filled with toxins because we are forced by um, simple location to drive everywhere. Um, they rebutted this with this comparison between New York City and San Jose, and then they brought in grass, um, which was really lingered upon for a while on both sides for some reason. Um, judges, the benefits of grass do not outweigh the benefits of getting rid of large-scale automobile use. That um, by being able to get rid of these, by allowing people to live in closer, more dense environments, allowing people to walk, allowing public transportation to be a more feasible option, um, it will lead to a healthier population. We win on this point. And because we win on this point, judges, we can win this debate. If you don't buy our environmental sustainability argument, we also see that we win by solving for the um, housing crisis, by uh, allowing supply to meet demand, and we allow for greater racial integration. For those reasons, we urge a strong vote for the affirmation. Thank you so much. Hey, can I get speaker positions for each side? Yeah, so for the AF, Michael Delgado was the first and third, and uh, Gabriel Stockwell was the second. For the NEG, Ayush Sharma was the first and third, and Govind Malsani was the second. So, sorry, I, I forgot to write it down. Can you guys uh, let me know speaker positions again? Yeah, so for the AF, Michael Delgado was the first and third, and Gabriel Stockwell was the second. And then for the NEG, Ayu Sharma was the first and third, and Govin Malsani was the second. I put it in the chat too.
Okay. Uh, I just submitted my ballot. I was the second judge to submit my ballot. So um, I guess I'll announce the decision and give my RFD, and then Claudia can give hers. Um, so uh, uh, it was a 1 1 split decision. I voted for the Gov. Um, I think the uh, Gov is ahead on the environmental claim. I think the next only real offense here is that, uh, you know, you can have more green space in single family housing. I don't think that's actually outweighed by um, the environmental gains that single fam that, that lack of single family housing provides. I think that's like I've had a lot more like leeway beyond just automobiles. Um, for example, like heating, electricity systems that are much more efficient, et cetera. But I think that the big one is like the, that I think that often makes pretty clear is just like automobile gains, right? Like if you look at, if you look at like CO2 emissions, um, and I, I feel like this is a point that should have been brought up in the round, but like generally, if you look at CO2 emissions, right, the urban centers are much, are like, are carbon negative, um, the relative, or at least much, much less carbon uh, emitting than like the surrounding single family neighborhoods. I think that's generally true. I don't think the green space arguments are that good. Like I live in New York City, right? So like we have a lot of green space. It's like there's no single family housing. Um, I think that's a generally fair to claim. And um, yeah, also I think I've could have pressed hard on the fact that grass is like often worse for the environment than just like not any green spaces at all. Um, I think redlining fell off the round. I think AF could have clarified that single family housing enables redlining to get much worse, although that's probably contestable with a negative. Um, again, I don't really buy those claims here. I will say though, for, for, for both themes, I think this is a general practice problem to debate is that like sources are unfalsifiable. Um, they're, they're okay. Like it's not like inherently bad to have a source. It's just not that relevant, right? Because I don't know whether or not you're making it up. So I think it's always good to have a strong warrant. And I think that's what was really needed this round is that both teams needed more, like stronger warrantation as to why your organs are true. But yeah. Okay. I think in terms of in terms of my view, why I think negative side win, I do think that their harms and their justification is more linked towards the motion. So I do think that the environment you can fix with like many different things. But A, I think the affirmative side, assuming that this racial integration will be possible and it will be done properly well, and that everyone will be satisfied. And kind of not respond to the claim from the negative side, that people have their preferences and they have their like freedom of choice in order to decide that they don't want to live in a particular space. And I think there are possible responses to be given towards this, but I don't think that they are delivered necessarily. Therefore, I think in the end, when I'm looking for the mechanism in the motion, I do think that the benefits from the prop side can be achieved all the way around. And I do think that the harms are um, are more exclusive from the uh, from the negative. In terms of a feedback for like both teams, which I think it would be useful, I don't think that setup of this debate was necessarily uh, was necessarily done pretty well. So, firstly. In terms of ban of uh, in terms of implementation of a ban, probably you are replacing this with something. Probably you presenting some level of narrative. I don't think that it would give voters a lot of like support or like or like satisfied their views if you would say that you are doing that in order to create racial integration. So probably the claim from the negative side is quite strong that people will be quite pissed about it and that people will react necessarily with the anger and that will not be something which they will be satisfied with. So I think when you are running some level of strategy cases and you're trying to make something realistic, I think you need to see how this will play out on a bigger picture, how it will be like sell to the public. And therefore, if this is a condition for your case to work well and for you to achieve your impact, I think it needs to be spent a little bit more time on proving that sort of claim. And as I said, from the negative side, I would weigh up more the people preferences uh, argument, which I think it's quite important about like why the comfort of living, why people have their own capital, why they should be able to make their decisions to have their uh, like single parent home and a single family home. And that should be something which uh, beneficial for them. But overall, as I said, I do think that that marginally for me, it's a ballot based on the reasons uh, presented before. And thank you for the round and wish you best of the luck for the next round.